Hello, everybody. Dr. B is here. I uh, have a shrimp farm shirt, so not a science shirt today. Um, not sure if any of you know what that is. That is from The Office. So I was a big fan of that show. All right. Well, let's get started into module four. So actually, let me try that again. I want to make sure I share the sound. There we go. All right, so module four, projectile motion, which is two-dimensional kinematics. Let's take a look here. Two, one, fire! Sensational. All right, that's kind of a silly video, but that is an example of a projectile, and a projectile is something that has gotten into motion and is now under the influence of gravity alone. So that should remind you of the definition of free fall, which is when gravity is the only significant force acting. So that's true. That uh, person, that stunt person who was flying through the air was in free fall. They were in, under the influence of gravity alone. Remember, something doesn't have to be going downward or going straight downward to be in free fall. Could be traveling straight upward, could be going in a parabola. Things can be in free fall and moving in any direction. Um, just has to be where gravity is the only significant force acting. All right, take a look at this video. This is for a ball and cart. If I depress it again. And okay, so this, actually, let's go back just a little bit. Start it. If I depress it again and give it a little bit of momentum, then what? Okay, so when he's holding the cart still, I didn't show that part, but when he holds the cart still and launches the ball, it just goes straight up, it comes straight back down. But when he gave it a push, the ball went up in a par parabolic arc and landed back in the cart. And well, I'll let you listen as he continues that explanation what happens is the, the ball looks like from my perspective and mine the ball looks like it's executing a parabolic trajectory from the point of view of the cart though an observer sitting in the cart the ball will go straight up and come straight back down on top of his head so that, that shows independence of motion in the X and the Y directions. And um, that's it. All right, so what's going on here? In module two, we learned about the kinematic equations of motion and we applied them to primarily or maybe entirely to things in the horizontal direction. Well, a projectile has motion in the horizontal direction. So we can use those same equations to analyze it. However, it turns out that a projectile, since free, uh, gravity is the only significant force acting on it, there are no forces acting in the horizontal direction. We'll get more into forces in module six. But since there's no forces acting in the horizontal direction, once it becomes a projectile, that means it has a constant horizontal velocity which means however fast it's going horizontally stays the same the whole time. And so that's what's represented by this blue arrow. That's the horizontal component of the velocity. And so the whole time it's in the air, it's going the same forward speed. For example, if something were traveling at one meter per second in the horizontal direction, it would be getting one meter farther, say to the right for every second that goes by. All right, and we already answered the why part because gravity is the only significant force acting and there are no significant forces acting in the horizontal direction. All right. Oh, sorry about the formatting here, uh, but let's also talk about the vertical direction. And we've already studied this in module three. So what's going on in the vertical direction? We know that the object is not uh, moving the same distance in each time period, 
So if we drop something, for example, uh, it would travel five meters in the first second um, and travel 20 meters between one, seconds one and two and so on um, because it's speeding up because gravity is acting. And so as something goes up and up and down, the vertical component of the velocity is changing. For example, here we can look at these kind of reddish pink arrows and, oh, I actually just noticed that. But anyway, it has a large vertical component to the velocity and then has a smaller vertical component to the velocity. And then this vertical component at the peak be, oh, hold on. I get my pen working here. No, doesn't let me use a pen. There we go. At the peak, Vy is equal to zero. I don't know why they had an arrow there on that particular graphic, but in any case, the vertical velocity is zero. Now the velocity is not zero because it still has a horizontal component, but the vertical velocity v sub y is zero. And then just a teeny bit past the peak, and we'll say that's for, for this place right there, right at the peak, but just past the peak. Now it has a downward velocity and that downward velocity gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Those aren't shown, but here's part way down and then farther down, you can see a bigger velocity. There's also some symmetry here, and that's a little bit more advanced, but the magnitude of this velocity here is the same as the magnitude here. In other words, the speed, the vertical speed is the same here as here and here as here, because those are at the same height. All right. The main point here is that the horizontal part of the motion is super boring. Okay. A sub x is equal to zero which makes those equations pretty simple. Really the only equation that's really valuable in the x direction is x equals x naught plus v naught x times t plus one half times ax times t squared. But that last term is gonna be zero because a sub x is zero. So that simplifies that equation to x equals x sub zero plus v sub zero x times t. Okay, and then the other three equations, you don't need them and or they're a repeat of that one that I just said. And that's it. The, the X direction, the horizontal direction for a projectile is super easy because the acceleration zero. Okay, now in the vertical direction, we still need all four equations. Well, depending on what the problem is. Um, but the good thing is we know the acceleration is always 9.8 meters per second squared downward, as long as we're on Earth. If we're on a different planet or, or on the moon, then we can look up what the acceleration is there. All right, keep going. Here's another uh, discussion. This is from figure 3.6 in your textbook. If we had two identical balls and we, we dropped one at the same time that we tossed a different one horizontally, okay? Not a little bit up or a little bit down, but perfectly horizontally, at the moment we let it go, okay? So we gave it some speed, which is represented by this black vector arrow here, okay? And that would have been, they would have been dropped from somewhere up here because by the time they get down to this level, they already have a velocity in the vertical direction shown by this green arrow here and here. So they both have the same downward velocity after some amount of time. This could be after like a 10th of a second. And then after two tenths of a second, they're both going down at the same speed, but it's a faster speed than before. Three tenths of a second, they're going even faster and faster and faster. And they both reach the ground at the same time. So it didn't matter that you threw the one ball forward at some speed, and it wouldn't matter if it was a fast speed or a slow speed. They're still going to hit the ground at the same time, which is Pretty cool. Um, all right, so I think that's all I wanted to say about that one. And you can read more about that in the OpenStax textbook. All right, so here are some examples for what the X and Y coordinates
coordinates could be for, say, this point right here, okay? So for this ball that was traveling in a, a parabolic arc, okay, so it's traveling along, what, what's happening when it gets to the end? How fast is it going? Well, I just made up some numbers here. It could be going eight meters per second downward and five meters per second to the right. Okay, and we're familiar with these symbols, V sub X and V sub Y from module two and module three. Okay, what we wanna do though is we wanna figure out how fast it was going and in what direction, because that's what velocity is, magnitude and direction. So what we'll do is we'll draw a better picture of this. So we'll take that black arrow and the green arrow and we'll put them together tip to tail. Okay, the tip of the black arrow and the tail of the green arrow. Or we could have done it the other way around. That would have been fine too. We could slide this black arrow down to here. We could put it right there. That'd be okay. Um, actually, what we would want to do is put it here. Sorry, apologize for that. Um, if we did it here, that would be tip to tip. But we could put it right here. We could draw the black arrow right there. And that would be okay. Um, what we do then is we go from the tail of the first one to the tip of the second one. And that is our overall velocity. Okay, so we label these and then we want to figure out, well, what's the magnitude of this hypotenuse? Okay, and that kind of gives it away by recognizing that this is a right triangle. Then we can apply trigonometry to it. So we can use uh, the Pythagorean theorem to figure out the size of V, All right? So we know that five meters per second squared plus eight meters per second squared is equal to the uh, magnitude of the hypotenuse squared. So that'd be five squared plus eight squared is 89. And then we take the square root of that, that comes out to be 9.43 meters per second. Okay, so that's how we find that. That came out to 9.43 meters per second. Sorry, that M is really small. What about the, the direction? Well, could we just say that that's, oh, negative 9.43 meters per second? No, because that arrow, that blue arrow is not in the negative direction. It's at an angle. It's, it's actually in the positive x direction and the negative y direction, but we can't just say that's negative because there's, there's lots of different downward angles that we could say, oh, that's negative. Um, we need to know specifically what direction. So we need an angle for it. That's the only way we're gonna be able to tell the direction of a two-dimensional vector. So to get the, the direction, we can use some more trig. We can use, for example, the tangent function Tangent is equal to opposite over adjacent. So from this angle right here, the opposite side over there is the eight meters per second. And the adjacent side is the five meters per second. So tangent theta equals eight meters per second over five meters per second. Or we can take the inverse tangent of both sides. And so then we get inverse tangent, put this into my calculator of eight over five the meters per second cancel, and then that comes out to be an angle of 58.0 degrees. Fifty-eight, and it's 0, 0.0, but I'll just write it like that. Okay. Now, thinking about this the other way around, a lot of times in a problem, you'll be given a velocity, an initial velocity or a final velocity, and you have to break it into its components, okay? In this one, we were taking the components and putting them together, but you also wanna have the skill to be able to take a, a vector at an angle and break it into components. So for example, V naught at an angle theta, we can break it into the V naught X and V naught Y using our sine and cosine functions. So sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. And so opposite of this would be V naught Y and hypotenuse is V naught. 
and then we multiply both sides by V naught, and we get this relationship here, and then the same thing for the cosine function, which is cosines adjacent over hypotenuse. Again, multiply both sides by, by V naught, and then we get this relationship here. Be careful though, because if this angle is the one specified, you don't wanna just memorize these, okay? I said, do not want to memorize those because what you really wanna memorize is that sine is opposite over hypotenuse and cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse because if you do that, you can apply those and you'll see that this is the case, that these are what goes with, with this diagram here. And again, the only difference is, is the angle specified relative to vertical or horizontal. And what doesn't change are the definitions of cosine and sine and tangent and the Pythagorean theorem. Those are your tools that you want to have in your trigonometry toolbox. All right. Uh, this is in the uh, module four note packet where it asks you, it, it references this figure and it says, hey, you can, you can draw this as an arrow to the right and then up, and then you put the hypotenuse in. But then it asks, what's the other way you can do it? And this is related to what I was talking about a couple of slides ago. You can do it in the other order. You could do the vertical one first instead of doing the horizontal one. And then you do the horizontal one second. And then you put the hypotenuse in. And if I were drawing this truly to scale, this would have the exact same length as this and be at the same angle. Okay. Now, I'm not saying this angle is 29 degrees, but the actual angle in space is the same as this, or at least it's pretty close. Uh, not bad for just freehanding it. Um, but either diagram is good. You can use either one. These are both good diagrams. Um, and this angle will just be 90 minus 29.1 or 60.9, okay? All right, here's a busy looking diagram. And so this is just summarizing what we were talking about before. So here, instead of there just being a few points with the, the velocity vectors on them, there's, there's several, and it shows this blue vector, which is V sub X, which is staying constant the entire time. And then the orange one, which is the V sub Y, which is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, and then it's zero at the top, and then getting bigger and bigger and bigger on the way down. And then it separates out and it shows just the horizontal parts, like they've been projected down onto there, and then it summarizes the vertical parts there. And, the, and another extra thing that this shows is it shows this purple arrow, which is the, the whole velocity at, at that time which is the vector sum of the horizontal and vertical components. Um, and so that gets smaller and smaller as you go. Horizontal part stays the same, vertical part gets smaller. So that means the total gets smaller as you go. At the top, the total is equal to the horizontal component. And, and thus you can't see the blue arrow because it's, it's just exactly covered by the purple one. They're the exact same size. And again, VY is zero at that time. Right, so mostly a summary, but just a little bit different way to look at that. There's lots of examples of projectiles in, in our lives. Uh, at the beginning, I showed you a ball and cart and a uh, person being shot out of a cannon. Not really happening in our everyday lives. And fireworks, I guess, aren't in our everyday lives, but they are a pretty common occurrence and uh, certainly something we love to watch. And so this would be important, people that are putting um, fireworks together that are figuring out how much of the explosive is needed to get it to a certain height um, and what angle would be good to get it to a certain location for optimal viewing and that sort of thing. Or somebody who's studying volcanoes and they find a rock some distance away and it's, it's lower than where it was shot from. And from that, they could then figure out how fast it must have been going when it was shot out of the volcano, as an example. All right. Here's a diagram that shows for a given um, launch angle, like 45 degrees here, what happens if you increase the speed that you launch it? Well, 
it's going to go farther and it's going to go higher. So at 30 meters per second, it reached a max height here. And at 50 meters per second, it reached this greater maximum height. That makes sense uh, as far as range. At 30 meters per second, it went that far, uh, which was like 92 meters. And if we shot it at 50 meters per second, it's going to go 255 meters. Not too surprising. But then we can look at, well, what about the angle? What if we keep the velocity, the initial velocity, the same, but we just vary the launch angle? So at these various angles, such as a 75 degree angle that's represented here, it goes way up really high, and then it lands there, not so far away, 100, well, kind of far, it's 128 meters, but not nearly as far as if you launch it at a 45 degree angle and it goes 255 meters. So it turns out if there's no air resistance or no significant air resistance, a 45 degree launch angle is the best angle. If you have significant air resistance, then lower and lower angles are gonna be the optimal for getting the best distance. Um, and you may know that if you've ever tried to, uh, to throw something as far as you possibly could and experimented around with it, maybe you played some football or baseball, you, you may recognize that uh, an angle less than 45 degrees is the best one. Another interesting thing here is to look at the 15 degree launch angle and note that where it lands, even though it doesn't go nearly as high as the 75 degree angle launch, its max height is way down here, it does go the same distance. So for any pair of angles that add up to 90 degrees, such as 15 and 75, they'll actually have the same range on horizontal ground, which is pretty cool. There's some symmetry there. There's really, when, when you look at this and you're changing the angle, it's two competing factors. The, the greater the angle, the more vertical velocity you're gonna get. And the more vertical velocity you have, that means you're gonna have more time in the air. So that's good. But the greater your launch angle, that means the less horizontal velocity you have. So that means it's not moving forward as much for every second that it's in the air. So higher angle is good for greater time in the air, but greater angle is bad for not being launched as fast forward. And so it's not traveling forward as much. So those two competing factors end up that the best angle for maximum range on level ground is a 45 degree angle. All right, um, this is just an extra, but it's kind of a cool thing to think about and it relates to what we'll do in chapter six uh, later on, and this will be in module seven. So this is imagining a really tall tower. This is way taller than any tower or any building or any mountain even on earth this one that's drawn here. So it's an imaginary tower. But if we were launching something from this imaginary tower, and the, and the reason it's so tall is because it's up above the atmosphere. The atmosphere only reaches to, you know, like about there. So we're up above the atmosphere, so there's no air resistance. So we launch it at some speed, and it, you know, goes pretty far, but hits the earth. Then we launch it at a greater speed, and we're launching horizontally, by the way, uh, and it goes farther and then so on. You keep launching at faster and faster speeds until you get to just the right speed, not too fast, not too slow, and it orbits around the Earth. Because, well, is it falling? Yes and no. It's being pulled on by the force of gravity. You can see all of these trajectories that were drawn in here from the slowest to the fastest, they're all curving. But the one that's at just the right speed that's falling around the earth. That's right. I said falling around the earth, okay? Because it's, it's falling. It's under the influence of gravity, but its curvature, the curvature of the trajectory is the same as the curvature of the earth. And so therefore it never gets any closer to earth. And so that's what's happening when something's in orbit is that it's under the influence of gravity, but it's curvature because of the force of gravity combined with how fast it's going is equal to the curvature of the earth so it's never getting any closer all right um, this example is talked about in your textbook as well 
And this was similar to what the guy was talking about in the ball and cart video. Uh, this is dropping a pair of binoculars from at the top of the mast. Uh, from his perspective, they go straight down, but from an observer on the side, they don't go straight down. They go in a parabolic arc because the, the boat and thus the binoculars and the man and everything on the boat had a, an initial horizontal velocity. So at the moment he dropped them, they, were, they had a horizontal velocity and they weren't headed downward at all. But as soon as he lets go, gravity starts pulling on them. So they get faster and faster downward. Um, so they're moving both horizontally and vertically and they follow this curved trajectory. All right, that's a good place to stop. Uh, there's just lots and lots of examples, uh, but I have to stop myself somewhere. If you have any questions, just let me know. Uh, make sure you check out all of the videos in the student note packet assignment. Um, as you're doing those, do as many of the problems on your own as you can before you watch any part of the video. If you're going to watch a video, watch part of it until you get unstuck, then pause the video and then keep doing the problem on your own. Um, and then you can check the video again at the end, make sure you didn't miss anything. All right, that's all for now.